Uh, good morning, everybody. And uh, Joe, it's fantastic to be here again. Thank you. And, and uh, I'm here. Um, and what a glorious day. It's a shame we can't have the sunroof going back uh, like the tennis court in Wimbledon. Maybe next year. Um, so in the theme of bringing the island together, I have been uh, somewhat passionate in the last two years since I spoke on the subject of uh, my history. And one of the great challenges, I think, is how you connect Belfast and Dublin closer together. Uh, but last month I wrote an article, uh, a short one, that contemplated in under 20 years' time, I could travel, we could travel, by rail, from Belfast to Dublin and on to Cork in under two hours. A number of people since then have said that would be a great ambition. I remember some decades ago watching an amazing program about the great engineer Barnes Wallace. He suggested one day that civil aircraft might travel from London to Sydney by supersonic aircraft after breakfast and be there by lunchtime that day and return back to London in the afternoon, late afternoon. That dream has not yet come to fruition and perhaps never will. After all, it is just under 17,000 kilometres, and to date, the best journey time is 22 hours, equating to nearly 800 kilometres per hour. However, today's rail technology across many parts of the world achieve day in, day out, that we can travel readily a distance of some 420 kilometres in just under two hours. That is, just over 200 kilometres an hour, or for those of us who still think in miles, just over 130 miles per hour. Early this year in Britain, the Intercity 125 was decommissioned after some 50 years of service. It started operating in the mid-1970s when Britain was basking in the glow of Harold Wilson's brave new world for Britain. Déjà vu. In the white heat campaign he declared a decade earlier. The clue in the Intercity 125 is the three numbers, 125 miles per hour, 50 years ago, 125 miles per hour. The maximum speed that the, the diesel trains travelled. The new replacements, which have started the Hitachi engine, will travel at a slightly faster speed, but in much greater luxury. The much vaunted HS2, which maybe we'll hear more about in the coming days, is however due to travel at a considerably faster speed, some 225 miles per hour, 225 miles per hour, and possibly even as fast as 400 kilometres or 250 miles per hour. The existing HS1's speed operates at 300 kilometres per hour or just over 185 miles per hour. It is worth noting that in continental Europe, TGV and Spain's AVT travel at more than 190 miles an hour, 190 miles an hour, or more than 300 kilometres per hour. You, however, have not asked me here today to share my train-spotting proclivities. <laughs> I assure you, I don't have any. The beauty of fascination, to my mind, is in the shortening of the journey time and all the attendant benefits to passengers and commuters, not to mention, of course, the increasing environmental dividends as trains move to electrification. In the case of the HS2, it will reduce the journey time from London to Birmingham to just under 50 minutes. Currently, the fastest train is 1 hour 21 minutes, whilst the average journey time is approximately 1 hour 58. With 142 trains, 142 trains travelling on average every weekday. We have eight train journeys between Belfast and Dublin a day and 16 between Dublin and Cork. 142, and we have eight and 16. It is anticipated that as part of the Northern Powerhouse dividend, then the second phase of travel, travel time to Manchester, will be halved, currently just over two hours for the fastest service, and an hour less than the journey time to Leeds. What I'm more particularly wanting to do is to give some sense of how we largely failed to pay attention to even the most basic train speeds between the three principal cities on the island of Ireland. There may be understandable reasons, but possibly not, particularly when you look at the map, which shows what an incredible legacy was left 100 years ago. I don't know if you can see that, but it just shows you there's the most amazing lattice work. And for all of us who travel to different parts of Ireland, 
and even coming here yesterday, and I travel down to West Court regularly, you see the remnants of the old railway stations. And that's what we had on this island 100 years ago. It's simply shocking to think what we've done since then. Some might argue that this was the golden age, and perhaps when you see this map, it was for rail across the island of Ireland. What I want to explore this morning, however, are the ingredients that might make us finally take the decision to reinvigorate connectivity by rail, particularly between the three principal cities on the island of Ireland, recognising that it requires massive mobilisation of resources. Talking of such mobilisation, I was fascinated to read, or should I say, to read the next step, or should I say quantum leap, that China is pursuing to connect 11 cities, in some cases mega cities, that cities have more than 10 million people, into what is called a melagopolis. I had to work on that one. With a catchment area of some 70 million people in the Pearl River Delta, enabling them to take on Silicon Valley and almost any part of the world at a globally competitive level. This is just another part of China's ambitions, ambitious infrastructure plans, alongside the umbrella of its quaintly named Belt and Road Initiative to open up trade globally, with both having planning horizons looking at over the decades ahead. Here is a snap of a short extract of a fascinating article featured on the World Economic Forum, showing you can sort of see, and it's difficult to actually denote to you the size of space but the ambition. And the intention is to bring all of these cities within roughly an hour's travel time. The plan encompasses Hong Kong and Macau, and earlier this decade, I was lucky enough to travel by high-speed boat from the mainland of China to Macau to see the, built, the bridge being built. This astonishing bridge, 34 miles or 55 kilometers, to Macau and completed in a decade, with nine other cities in the Guangdong province of mainland China to create a world-class cities cluster. All of this to be done, apparently, by 2035. Yes, that is just 15 years from now. I'm sure that the great engineers of Ireland and Britain of yesteryear that achieved so much to transform the connectivity across the island of Ireland would relish the opportunity to take on this competitive challenge, and so must we. Earlier I used the word ingredients. What are they? They are a set of economic, social, demographic factors, not to mention at last a recognition of the critical environmental factors we face. They will all play a part in what can be a quantum leap in connecting the island and improving dramatically our environmental footprint. To my mind, we need to develop a framework or mindset that can galvanise our thinking. What might that be? For those of you who know David Putnam, he at one stage chaired the committee of both houses to scrutinise, 12 years ago, the House of Lords Climate Change Bill. And at the address he gave on that day, on the 27th of November, he went into some very, very powerful language. And I would love to share it with you, but in the interest of time, I'm not going to. But he drew an analogy to slavery, 200 years previously, there had been a state of mind in Britain that slavery would be appalling and devastating to the economy of Britain. And of course, it was exactly the opposite. Well, there are other analogies that we might draw on in terms of Brexit. But it's a very powerful speech, and it will be in my notes. And I, I'd rather, given today, I think I'll, I'll leave it, but it is an intensely moving speech. The second example I'm going to reference is Tim Harford's brilliant book, Tim Harford goes in the FT as the undercover economist, and he wrote a brilliant book some years ago called Adapt. I can only recommend it to you. But he cites the beginning of the extraordinary journey and transformation of the economy of China from 1980. And he focuses on one person's extraordinary pragmatism, Deng Xiaoping, who had a trial and error approach. Of course, the Chinese premier had a much more evocative phrase crossed in the river by feeling for stones, which I can readily identify with, as a week ago today, I had an appalling fall in Mallorca, running down a hill, and until yesterday morning, I was in plaster. So it's a lovely phrase. I'll just repeat it. Crossing the river by feeling for stones. And I think, in many senses, across the island of Ireland, we are feeling for stones. Some might consider what happens in China may have little consequences for us on this little island of ours, Increasingly, though, international investors want to see there is a ready pool of talent that can be readily transported to and from urban conurbations. In an important piece of work by the Irish Academy of Engineering in 2016, the Belfast-Dublin Economic Corridor, 
looking at the Belfast Dublin Economic Corridor, on the stewardship of Lee and Canellan, it anticipates the Dublin Belfast Economic Corridor has the potential to become a European growth hub of transnational importance with a population of 4 million people by the 2030s. Adding in the Dublin Court Corridor, this readily would add another million people, which gives us a critical mass of talent to draw upon to attract international capital. Some people have suggested that this is a fanciful idea, but as Mark Coleman, who now works for IBEC, recently pointed out in an excellent presentation on the future of the island, we should recognise that the island remains remarkably underpopulated, and even if it was to double in size from the existing 6.8 million to, say, 15 million people, we would still be catching up with the growth in population over the past 200 years in the recent mainland Europe, let alone the explosive growth of Britain in, over that time. So I'm sure you can see those figures clearly. But to me, this is a really startling graph and just shows you the extent to which, for historical reasons, uh, I'll use a slightly tricky word, our growth has been stunted. And we have a massive opportunity to transform that. And this is why, when people tell you rail is not affordable, we need to change our perspective. And it's fundamental we understand the basis on which we're on this island. My fundamental belief is that we have not yet come to appreciate the extraordinary opportunity that the island of Ireland has in its gift. John Henry Newman anticipated at the same time as the great engineers of Ireland worked on the rail network that he could foresee an amazing future for the island. I believe we've only just begun on that journey, but the next stage will need to embrace <coughs> rail. Until recently, there seemed to be a very close parallel to Augustine's plea to chastity. We've known... We need to take radical action to tackle climate change, but we've always thought to do it not just yet. The jury is still out whether Augustine is winning. A decision to put in place a plan to connect our three principal cities would be proof indeed that we were finally taking the necessary action to tackle one significant aspect of reducing carbon emissions as well as achieving a modal shift from car to rail. It will, in time, also assist in attracting more people into our principal cities and creating that much-needed critical mass, which I will cover shortly. Today, the island's population is approaching 6.8 million, with 4.8 in the Republic. It is anticipated that in the Republic, the population will grow to some 6 million by 2050, if not more, an increase of nearly 23%. Mark Coleman recently posited that if the population of Dublin was to grow by twice this rate from the census of 2016 to 2050, Dublin's population will grow from 0.554 million to 0.81 million. The dynamics of population growth in Northern Ireland are not currently as vibrant, at least not for most of us. My wife and I have eight kids, and I know it is not very environmentally friendly, but that's my challenge. But let's just assume that Belfast's population mirrored this growth rate the population of Belfast would reach the critical level of 0.5 million, and I emphasise the importance of 0.5 million. The next largest city on the island of Ireland would be Cork at 0.18 million, just under 200,000. And there's the metrics. And it is, it is fundamental to understand... That's not visible. Okay. So, uh, thank you, Joe. Uh, I mean, it's essentially what you'll see in the middle of the graph is 0.81 million, and Belfast at 0.49 million, assuming the same growth rates, and then Cork at just under 200,000, and then the rest are sort of in the 100,000s, uh, and, and that gives you some sense of where we might be by 2050 on the current population. Together, these three cities will have a population of some 1.5 million. In my view, this is noteworthy, given that already 55%, 55% of the world's population lives in urban areas. And today in Ireland, we're not anywhere near that. And it's widely anticipated to grow to two-thirds by the middle of the century. China today has more than 100 cities, 100 cities with a population over, 100, sorry, over 1 million, with more than 220 cities reaching this level by 2025. So 100 cities a million today and 220 cities within six years' time. There is an increasing sense that cities of a million or more will become increasingly accretive, and certainly there cities that are only half a million or less will struggle to demonstrate to international investors that they have the depth of talent 
and variety that are so vital to competing in a global market. These two snapshots, which I'm about to show you, from the United Nations World Cities in 2018, illustrate the scale of change that is taking place across the globe, and of course, Europe is not immune. It is likely that climate emergency measures will accelerate this further, albeit some cities are themselves particularly susceptible to rising sea levels, and therefore the pattern may alter in ways that we have, never, we have not sufficiently appreciated. Uh, I'm afraid this will also not be visible to you, but the key point here is the magnitude of the changes taking place in the world's population. And the next graph shows you, and obviously this will be in the paper, shows you what's happening across the globe. From a European perspective, then Dublin is one of the existing 88 cities in Europe between 0.5 million and 1 million, with its cohort growing by 6 from 88 to 94 over the next 12 years, with cities over 1 million growing by 3 by three, from 52 to 55. So there are only 52 cities in Europe who will have a population of 1 million or more today and 55 by 2030. There are only six cities in Europe that will have a population of greater than 5 million now, uh, between now and 2030. Belfast, in that short time, will not have yet gained entry to the starting gate of a population of more than 0.5 million. And Cork, Limerick, Galway and London Derry, Derry still fall far short. But there is hope if the right infrastructure to facilitate this growth starts to be put in place. To do otherwise, today's current problems are likely to be accentuated. My own hunch is that as both the UK and Irish governments truly grasp the emergency measures that are needed to tackle climate change, we will in fact attract more people to Ireland, to Ireland shores, than are currently anticipated. The island of Ireland is very well placed in so many respects to maximise from the opportunities ahead. But it does require some generational investment decisions to be made now. Ironically, not making them is also a decision, as both Dublin and Belfast already face chronic tra traffic congestion, and in the case of Dublin and Greater Dublin, and indeed Cork as well, massive house shortages, not to mention overheating of the economies. And this recent article in the Irish Times, I thought, really captured it. Um, you know, uh, a plea which I'd make to McGill and any commentator is, can we stop putting maps up with the six counties blanked out? It's just appalling. It, I mean, I, should, I think there should be a human, a human rights thing on this. It's shocking. Shocking. Anyway, that was my rant. Uh, rail offers one of the best ways in creating great equilibrium across the island meeting the massive environmental challenges that we face, but as importantly, it creates a level of connectivity across this island that many, thought, many of us thought was the prerogative of other parts of the world, which bizarrely include many of our European neighbours. Only yesterday, I read a fascinating article, it was for me anyway, about a plan that Denmark has been considering for the past five years to link up its five major cities by train with a journey time no longer than an hour between each creating a single unified metro area. Denmark's population is 5.75 million and Copenhagen is by far the largest city at 1.28 million. 1.28 million. Bring it on, Dublin. With our house next at 0.265 million, so very comparable. The drivers of the green agenda but also attracting global capital. Regional cities are less likely to play second fiddle to Copenhagen when it comes to companies choosing their HQ with this infrastructure in place. The social benefits, I believe, will be enormous across the island, allowing a much greater degree of mobility than hitherto, irrespective of all the current fears of a hard border. Of course, in no way do I say this to belittle this threat, the threat this threat poses, but we need to plan for a better future, irrespective of what immediately lies ahead. Finally, many people have suggested that we cannot afford to consider such a grandiose plan. In the joint IBEX CBI report last year, Business on a Connected Island, it identifies that the combined economies of Ireland equated to 326 billion euro, 326 billion euro, making it the third largest economic area on these two islands after London and the southeast regions. Why can we not understand we have the wrong infrastructure for that economy? And we need to do so much more. And our politicians are terrified of this, but it's fundamental to our future. As we all know, this economic growth has been particularly buoyant in and around the Dublin region. The Eastern Corridor of Ireland has been transformed in recent decades, and the prospect is that it will continue into the foreseeable future, although it has brought considerable challenges to the inhabitants. I hope 
what I've outlined today will bring a better and cleaner future for us all from one end of this precious island to another. The beauty of this project is the potential it has to bring a huge percentage of the island's population closer together. As it gains momentum, I'm certain that other rail linkages could be enhanced, thereby improving the links to other cities across the island of Ireland, because I can just feel Dennis and Paul say, what about us? By starting this journey now, we might, we might just have something that puts us on the global map by 2035. And I hope, ladies and gentlemen, that the 2019 McGill Summer School is the first step in making it happen. Thank you very much. Thank you.